So before 1994, there was slightly upward trend over here in some of these indications. Um, it reached a, a maximum 1982, then it started to contract. Then NAFTA came into effect, and this suddenly like, st stabilized. Which means that, for example, let's look at this one over here, which is um, a real GDP per worker. Real GDP per worker in Mexico in 1950 was 40% in Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the US. At some point, it reached to be almost 70%. So Mexico was 70% as productive as the US. Then the crisis came, and Mexico lost a lot of property. Okay, and then, but when that went well into effect, Mexico was here, less than 40%, back to where it was in 1950. And then, there was after the first adjustment over here, it basically stagnated. So since NAFTA came into effect, Mexico's labor productivity is a little bit like one third of productivity in the US now. Uh, but the most important striking thing to me is how, how stable it has become. And what that suggests, and this is part of a paper I wrote with uh, Robert Blecker, um, uh, what that, the interpretation I gave to, to this result is that Mexico has actually become like part of the North American uh, cycle. Uh, business cycle, basically. And when you see what has happened here, for example, this is the industry in Mexico and the US. Mexico is the blue one, US is the red one. Before, before NAFTA, every, every, the industry in Mexico and the industry in the US follow their own cycles, basically. Ups and downs, separate. After NAFTA, and just after the small crisis in Mexico, the crisis in Mexico in 1995, they have basically synchronized, as you can see. And synchronizing doesn't mean that Mexico is pulling out the, the U.S. economy. Of course. Mex the Mexican economy is like 8% of the total U.S. economy. So that means that Mexican economy is being pulled by the U.S. economy. So Mexico has been, become part, somehow, of the U.S. economy business cycle. Okay? And look how closely uh, uh, we are now uh, related. And the fact that we have been growing at the same rate during the same period, and we have contracted simultaneously in 2000 when there was the U.S. recession, and now in 2008 with the, with, with, the, with, the, with the global recession as well. So that means that we are basically moving in tandem, and that explains why we had this previous result of it, that we are basically pretty much along the same, and uh, we are moving in parallel lines, and therefore we are not converging. So the great promise of NAFTA, which was for Mexico to converge to the U.S., not, not is the convergence, would mean that this should have an upward sloping. Uh, and hopefully reach for Mexicans and it's reaching to one. The fact that we, this is not growing, it is rather stagnant. That, mean, that means and with, um, that the gap between the U.S. and the, and the Mexican economy is pretty much stable. And that's why you still observe these pressures for migration. Because the gap has not closed at all. If anything, it has widened. Because uh, even though the, the, the rates are similar, in absolute levels, that gap has widened. And therefore, the, the incentives for Mexican workers to come to the U.S. are still present. Um, now, the other thing is, which is important is, is the following. Mexico's trade against the world is completely odd. When NAFTA was discussed in Mexico, there was a lot of concern in Mexico. We, had, we in Mexico had like, a lot of like, rot per rot. I don't know if you remember what the discussion was in the U.S. Um, but rot per rot was worried about uh, NAFTA implying uh, that the U.S. would be losing a lot of jobs to Mexico. Uh, this, this was this idea of the giant sucking sound of the firms moving back to, to Mexico. Well, in Mexico was something similar. A lot of people was concerned because Mexico was not being competitive against the U.S. and Mexico was the industry. In Mexico was going to disappear and so on. Because we are we are not competitive. That's what we, a lot of people argue. Well, what has happened after NAFTA is interesting because this, Mexico has an extraordinary surplus with, against the U.S. We now, uh, this is billions of dollars, the surplus, which means that we, Mexico sells goods to the U.S. Uh, in excess of the goods that Mexico buys from the U.S. from ar around $80 billion per year. So that's the surplus Mexico has against the U.S. Okay. So we are very competitive against the U.S. We sell the U.S. a lot of goods from Mexico. Cars, uh, I mean, uh, uh, a lot of electronic goods, computers, TV, plasma TVs, uh, uh, you name it. 
many goods, uh, uh, manufactured goods, actually. Uh, uh, so Mexico has had this huge surplus against the US, which means that we are competitive against the US. But look what happens on the other hand. We, are, we have a, a huge deficit against all the other countries in the world. All non-USA countries, we have, it's just it's pretty much the same. The, and this is the balance. It's a slight deficit against the rest of the And this, this is basically against Asia. So we have a huge surplus with the US. We have a huge deficit against Asia. And that means that we are competitive against the US market, but we are not competitive against Asian countries, or Europe for that matter. So actually, Mexico only has surplus, trade surplus against the US and against um, uh, Guatemala. So uh, those are the only two countries which we, Mexico has the surplus. Which means that we don't have a domestic engine. I mean, we are basically engaged, uh, we are basically a, a, a link to the US economy. And that's actually the only force that we are, is, is actually promoting growth in Mexico. Mexico has not a domestic engine, in contrast to many other big countries, uh, like Brazil or so, which they, they, they might have a domestic engine from their own. Um, and the other thing is that we have been unable to diversify trade, and uh, particularly exports. 80% of our exports go to the US market. So, to me, the only, okay, given that what I just said, uh, the, the only explanation that I really believe are important are the following three days, uh, which I, I think explain a lot of what has been happening in this. One is that we have poorly functioning credit market, which is the first argument that Hanson mentioned, and some others have mentioned, or even Rab Chiquian and Ramos Sancho, although at the end they don't, they don't think it's still quite important. But I think lack of competition in the credit market, the banking sector in particular, meaning that Banks and the financial sector do not does not provide credit to the rest to the private sector. is very important, um, and uh, so this is one thing. Second, lack of competition in general, which is partially related to this. But this lack of competition is important in all these sectors I mentioned: telecommunications, energy, and so on. So we need to strengthen the commissions, like uh, uh, and the antitrust commission in particular, to be able to really enforce uh, uh, anti-competitive. Uh, uh, the behavior and the COFETEL, which is the entity uh, uh, regulating telecommunications in Mexico. And third, educational level. But not the PISA thing, the ones that measure uh, 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 education at the basic level. I think the main problem is particularly in tertiary education. And let me show you just, uh, on which stat I'm going to end. Um, uh, these are the, the three most important things to me. And let me show you something. And that's why the title of my talk is Why Should Mexico Be Built? Uh, see what has happened with education. This is data from the OECD, um, share of population with access to high school, meaning that at least have one year of high school. Okay? Uh, and these are three, three cohorts, 25 to 34, 55 to 54, and 55 to 64. So three cohorts just to see how has, that has changed the access to tertiary education levels in these countries has, has taken place in the past, in, uh, over, the, over the years. So. And it's, it's, it's ranked uh, by those uh, that have the highest level over here for the, for the older group in this in, the, in these three cohorts. So, so the USA and, uh, and, and the one in, in the lowest rank, which is Indonesia over here. So the USA, for example, has access, more than 80% of those between 55 and 64 had access to high school level. Whereas in Indonesia, less than 10% have. Over the time, uh, as you can see, USA has basically remained stable but at a very high level. You, in contrast, you have countries like uh, Korea, for example, that only one third of the population, or the older population, had access to high school, but now almost everyone, the youngest generation, has access to high school. So that's a complete, a dramatic change. It's partially explains what has happened with Korea in terms of the, of, of the, of the dynamic of GDP growth for this country. Um, I was looking for Spain, but I don't see Spain here. It's Spain. Spain has also moved from less than 20% to almost 60% in terms of get, getting, uh, providing access to high school for the, for the, young, people, for the young people in, in, in that country. Mexico instead is here. But not only at the very lowest levels here, over here, 12% um, of the population had access, of the older segment of the population had access to high school uh, uh, back, uh, back then. And now, but even with the youngest generation, those between 25 and 34 years of age, only one-fourth of them have access to high school. So 
And this is just getting access. It's not finishing high school. It's just getting at least one year of high school studies. So you think that one out of four Mexicans is getting is a study when they are between uh, 25 and 34. But in this cohort of age, when they actually study high school, um, that means that three of them are not in school. And that partially explains also this uh, situation in which um, uh, they don't have better opportunities, better wages, and so on. So if one out of four, the youngest, and it, of course it's the lowest in this, on, on this group, as you can see here. And uh, 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 so how can we expect to have a more productive I mean, I, I, What I would say is, actually, it, in some sense, it's America that Mexico has the role. No. Actually, no matter how close it is to where they live, they, they go and attend for a year. They go and it's, it's, it's actually in that sense, in the second okay. set, the sense you mentioned, that they, uh, they attended at, at least one year of time. Okay. So there might be problems of demand and problems of supplies. Okay. Uh, so, uh, but this is just the fact that what's the percentage population of those uh, uh, ranges of age that have uh, gotten at least one year of high school education? And as I said, it's very low. It's just, just think that this level of education, for example, was the one that Italy had um, for the older generation. So we're 30 years behind Italy, and not to mention how, how, how far we behind all these other countries. For example, the USA probably had this level of access to high school education probably at the beginning of the, the 20th century, more or less, just to give you an idea how far behind we are in terms of of human capital formation in Mexico. So, and that's why I, the title of my talk is that, I mean, this, why, uh, why Mexico is rich? Why, why should it be? I mean, what have we been doing in the past few years to expect something different? I don't think we have been doing the most important things, like, for example, investing in human capital. Now, think about credit to the private sector, which is the other thing, just to give you a, an idea. This is, this is, these are the, all the, the countries rank here, and this is banking credit to the private sector, okay? Mexico is right here, of all these countries. Um, Mexico is between, Bot just to give you an idea, it's between Botswana and Burundi, two African countries. And the, from all the other countries over here, there are only African countries and Argentina. And Argentina, because it had these this big problems in, at, the, at the beginning of the century, this uh, uh, financial crisis. Other countries which are directly the interest to Mexicans, at least, are, I'm putting here Brazil and Chile, which are Latin American countries, or the BRICS, uh, Russia, India, and China over here. So Mexico is well below all these countries in terms of the financial development. So with the, with that, what that means is that the banks in Mexico actually are, are not lending money to the private sector, but are lending very little. Mexican financial system in Mexico is as developed as, a, as an African country, which used to be very, I mean, are much poorer than Mexico is. Um, so let me skip all this. Uh, and that has to do with high concentration in, 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 in the banking sector. For example, the, the two biggest banks in Mexico have 55% of total profits in the sector. When you have the four biggest banks in Mexico, they, are, they, they have 80% of total profits in Mexico. So they are huge banks, national banks in Mexico, which is not like in the US. In the US, you have thousands of banks. And even the two largest banks in, in the U.S. are like 10% of total profits at most. In Mexico, the four largest largest banks have 80% of total profits. The six largest banks have 92% of total profits, you know, or 82% of assets, 85% of deposits, 94% of income from fees, and so on. So it's highly concentrated. So it's an oligopoly, actually. It's an oligopoly in Mexico, which actually the size colluding by collusion, decide to charge high interest rates to, to lenders, um, and lenders do not take that risk. And, uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, and, and you may ask, well, how is it that these banks are profitable? Well, they are profitable because they charge high fees to those few which are the customers, on the one hand. And on the other hand, they lend money to the, to the government. And that's the way they, they, they survive. And they are among the most profitable institutions in Mexico, and are probably the most profitable segments of the international banks uh, in the world because of the high fees they charge. And, uh, and now, 
Why is that important? Why is K to the power of theta so, so important? And why I think that's critical to understanding the quantum semester? Huh? Well, there's a long literature, a large literature discussing that. It's important for factor accumulation. If we have a good financial sector that lends money to be perhaps a good idea, that promotes factor accumulation. So think that you might have a good idea, you go to a bank here, and then you get some money, and then you start a business. Well, that doesn't happen. And you cannot go to a bank and ask for money because if you are a small business, it's very hard for you to get uh, that loan. If that happens, therefore, that means that you cannot, it, it inhibits uh, factor accumulation in general, on the one hand. So we cannot accumulate capital enough, which is one of the factors of growth in, in, in any economy. Second, diminishes factor productivity growth. And diminishes because what the banks do is they tend to lend to those firms which are already well established which are very profitable, like large firms, firms that ex ex export, multinational firms, for example, which is, is, is the, more, the more secure investment for a bank, if you think about it, which is fine, except for the fact that those are not necessarily the most productive firms in, like, in, in an economy like Mexico. The most productive firms in an economy like Mexico are probably the, the smaller ones, uh, uh, or medium-sized firms. So um, by lending money, to the big firms, which I can actually borrow from abroad, is the big firms in Mexico, like Ford, or all these multinationals, can actually borrow in New York. They don't even have to borrow in Mexico money. But they do borrow in Mexico. Uh, uh, but, and, uh, and so by lending money to these big firms, we are allocating resources to sectors and firms and areas which are the less productive in the economy. And that, that's why I said it's not a problem of generating jobs, but it's which jobs are we generating we are generating low productivity jobs because we are lending money to those firms which are low productivity firms. And we have, on the other hand, low productivity labor force because it's not well educated, as I showed show, show you before. So, um, and having credit to the private sector is important because it promotes, uh, there's a paper, a nice paper, that shows that financial development promotes, which is called convergence to the technology market. Because when a firm has access to this uh, uh, money, can invest in new technology, can adopt new technology, can actually adapt new technology and so forth. So they can convert to the technology. Together. And this is not what this is not what's happening in Mexico. We are not converting to the to, to the technology frontier, which in this case is for purposes uh, for our purposes is basically the US market. As we saw before, we are not combining at all. And part of that I think I'm, I'm trying to argue here has to do with this. It also has a, has, a, has an, an impact in terms of expanding firm size, which is important. So uh, credit, private credit to the private sector means that sm micro firms can become small firms, small firms can become medium-sized firms, and medium-sized firms can become large firms. And, 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 that, and that's something is not happening. So we have a, n a large number of micro firms, uh, micro-sized uh, firms, uh, which are fine, but they tend to be also very vulnerable. They um, uh, die a lot, uh, uh, they disappear uh, uh, very often. So uh, we cannot actually expand the firm size in Mexico, average firm size in Mexico. So that will create the private sector, which is something that no, many people don't think is quite important. I think it's very important. And in particular in Mexico, and I, and I think that's why it's important that I show you this uh, graph before, where, where Mexico is related to the rest of the world, it's important. Because that shows you the, how, how little uh, banks in Mexico lend to the private sector. And just to give you an, uh, another idea, just where are we now? We are now here. This is, this is private credit, uh, banking, domestic credit to the private sector. Um, and at some point, we were here. I mean, mo in the 1960s, we were lend banks were lending much more money to the, to the private sector. At some point, this collapsed because of the crisis. It has never recovered, actually. Only recovered in a period that actually led to a crisis, because it was very badly regulated. So, but the, the thing is, we have bad regulation, a lot of monopolies, oligopolies in these key sectors of the economy, and we also have this low education and, and human capital uh, 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 labor force in Mexico. So with all that, I think, um, let's keep all this, um, uh, that it is true that, as Hanson uh, said at some point, the industry in Mexico and the US. Mexico is the blue one, US is the red one. Before, before NAFTA, every, every, the industry in Mexico and the industry in the U.S. follow their own cycles, basically, ups and downs, separately. After NAFTA, 
and just after the small crisis in Mexico, the crisis in Mexico in 1995, they have basically synchronized, as you can see. And synchronizing doesn't mean that Mexico is pulling out the, the U.S. economy. Mexi the Mexican economy is like 8% of the total U.S. economy. So that means that the Mexican economy is being pulled by the U.S. economy. So Mexico has been, become part, somehow, of the U.S. economy business cycle. Okay? And look how closely... Uh, uh, so before 1994, there was slightly upward trend over here in some of these indications. Um, reached a, a maximum 1982, then it started to contract. Then NAFTA came into effect, and this suddenly like st stabilized. Which means that, for example, let's look at this one over here, which is um, a real GDP per worker. Real GDP per worker in Mexico in 1950 was 40% in Mexico vis a vis the US. At some point, it reached to be almost 70%. So Mexico was 70% as productive as the US. Then the crisis came, and Mexico lost a lot of property. Okay, and then, but when that went well into effect, Mexico was here. That the gap between the US and the, and the Mexican economy is pretty much stable. And that's why you still observe these pressures for migration. Because the gap has not closed at all. If anything, it has widened. Because uh, even though the, the, the rates are similar, in absolute levels, that gap has widened. And therefore, the, the incentives for Mexican workers to come to the US are still present. Um, now, the other thing is, which is important is, is the following. Mexico's trade against the world is completely odd. When NAFTA was discussed in Mexico, there was a lot of concern in Mexico. We, had, we in Mexico had like, a lot of like, rod per rod. I don't know if you remember what the discussion was in the US. Um, but rod per rod was worried about less than 40%, back to where it was in 1950. And then there was, after the first adjustment over here, it basically stagnated. So since NAFTA came into effect, Mexico's labor productivity is a little like one third of productivity in the US now. Uh, but the most important, exciting thing to me is how, how stable it has become. And what that suggests, and this is part of a paper I wrote with uh, Robert Blecker, um, uh, what that, the interpretation I gave to, to this result is that Mexico has actually become like part of the North American uh, cycle, uh, business cycle, basically. And when you see what has happened here, for example, this is, we are now uh, related. And the fact that we have been growing at the same rate during the same period, and we have contracted simultaneously, first in 2000 when there was the US recession, and now in 2008 with the, with, with, the, with, the, with the global recession as well. So that means that we are basically moving in tandem. And that explains why we had this previous result of it, that we are basically pretty much along the same, um, uh, we're moving in parallel lines, and therefore we are not converging. So the great promise of NAFTA, which was for Mexico to converge to the US, not, not is the convergence, would mean that this should have an upward slope, uh, and hopefully reach, for Mexicans, at least, reaching to one. The fact that we, this is not growing, which is rather stagnant, that, mean, that means, and with, um, 